please join me in our call to worship? How good it is to sing praises to our God. Come on, guys. For God is gracious, healing the brokenhearted, binding up their wounds. God's understanding is beyond all measure. Praise the Lord. We come today to worship you, our God, with candlelight, prayer, your word read and spoken. We celebrate the love you have for each of us, for all of your creation, and share that love in Holy Communion, in our meal of bread and juice. Let us stand and worship with song 793, and you might want to look at your hymnals for this song. seated. God, our creator, knows each of us by name and knows our hearts. Let us confess our sins before our God who desires to save us and set us free. Please join me. Gracious God, it is tempting to give up and give in, to hide from the injustices of the world to protect ourselves and our own, to turn off the evening news full of bad news. Forgive our sins of escape, of ignoring, of turning our backs on those in need. Forgive our sins of apathy when you call us to action. Renew us, O holy God, by your grace. Strengthen us to follow Christ's call. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen.
Good morning. Please be seated. Today's scripture reading is from Mark 1, 29 through 39. After teaching and healing in the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of his disciples, Simon and Andrew, with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered round the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was dark, still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout all of Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out the demons. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise Praise be to God. I turned myself off. Sorry. (laughs) Children, children of the congregation, come forward. Here it comes. (laughs) Gary, we might need to uh, replace the carpet padding in our sanctuary based on how that sounded. Hi. How are you guys? Good. Good. So listen, today we're going to celebrate communion. That's why the table is set the way that it is. And I want to share some ideas with you about communion. When, you, when, when we're at communion table, Nancy is going to be with me, and then we're going to have two others over there, and they're going to have, we're going to have some people who go around to serve communion to those who can't, be, um, who can't come forward. When ministers do that, we are wanting to do what Jesus did. We're acting the way that Jesus acted. And he gave us this meal so that, what are you guys looking at? Oh, me and you. Okay. <laughs> Here, go like, go like this. You do this. Yeah, see, it is you. <laughs> All right. I was wondering what you were looking at. You can see the back of your shirt? Yep. I can see the front of your shirt. You can't see the front of your shirt, can you? No, you cannot. (laughs) When we are serving the communion, we give you the bread when you come up here, and then they, they give you the cup over there. This is what Jesus did with his disciples. You'll hear about it, how he took the bread and how he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And when we do that, there's this special moment, Hadley, when it's just you and me, or just you and Nancy, and we say something to you like, this is the bread of heaven. Or, this is the body of Christ that is given for you. And it's a special moment just between the two of us. Yeah. Yeah. My shoe, my shoe fell off. It did. I love that moment. And what I, what I hope that it says to you is that Jesus loves that moment too. It's, he loves you. He has a special place for you in his heart. And he's got gifts that he wants to give you your whole life long. Even if they're very good gifts, and sometimes Jesus gives us gifts that we don't really want, but he knows that they're good for us, and eventually we'll look back and say, oh, I see what I learned from that. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you make mistakes, and you praise to God, and you ask for forgiveness, and then you give him the gift. 
When we make mistakes, one of the best gifts we receive is God's forgiveness. That is right. Well, when you're on your way up here, there's going to be people in front of you. And when you have that special moment with me or Nancy and you go out back to your seat, there are going to be some people behind you also. And sometimes we have to wait. It, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to serve everybody communion. But the thing I want you to remember when we have communion is that everybody in front of you and behind you is also special to Jesus. And Jesus loves them also. And he's got gifts for them as well. And so while you're waiting for everybody to be served, what I'd like you to think about today is giving thanks for God being, having you as special in, in the life of God, but also giving thanks that Jesus thinks everybody else that we're waiting for is special too. Okay? That'll make it easier to wait. All right. Let me pray for us. God, we give you thanks that you have given us these special moments, that you speak to us, that you love us, and that you give us good gifts. And we pray that as we wait in our lives and for others, that we remember that you love them as well. Thank you for all of these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, can you look at yourself one more time? Hey, let's see if you can turn your head fast enough that you can see yourself looking at yourself in the TV. Can you turn your head that fast? Watch this. Nope. (laughs) You might have a hard time walking back up that hill. (laughs) All right. See you guys. Let's listen to some music.
that was an appropriate anthem for us to hear on this first Sunday of Black History Month, a setting of a very Euro-Anglican uh, setting in an African-American uh, idiom. That was written by Charles Wesley. You, if you were listening to the lyrics, heard Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But then it was set by uh, George Elderkin to We'll Walk in the Light. And thank you for that. You won't hear that again until Christmas. <laughs> Not during Advent, but during Christmas. When God blesses us, we feel like we are at the center of the universe. But we aren't the center of the universe. <laughs> And this can sometimes come as a harsh reality. But does it have to? Let us pray. Holy Spirit, bless us with the hearing of God's word this morning and grant us courage to receive it and faith to follow it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When we experience some kind of a transformation or a conversion in our lives, it is often uh, and, and really should be a very personal kind of experience. For me, I didn't grow up in the church. We were a Christmas and Easter family. And so it was in high school that I began my own relationship with God through Christ. And it was uh, through the ministry of young life. And, and I was living in Colorado Springs even then. And for me, that, that conversion was around the message of, of God's love for me. This was a message that resonated deeply in, um, in my needs at that time. And it was then that I decided to follow God through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Spirit. Because God loves me. And it was personal. And it was powerful. But it was difficult, and it took a long time, for me to accept that God doesn't just love me, but that God loves everybody. Um, I call that kind of a decentering experience. Um, and I remember when the, the first kind of significant decentering experience was. This was already, I was in college at this point, and I uh, was going to different churches. And I was talking to the pastor of one of these churches, and um, he said, Well, let's, let's talk about this through the Bible. So, I opened up the Bible, and I started reading, and I had these questions, and I was wondering, you know, how does this all apply to me? And I, I, read, this, I read this scripture, and I said, well, because I don't, I don't experience this gift. And the scripture says that I should. And the pastor said to me, why do you think that scripture was written for you? I was like, because God loves me, and it's the Bible, and it's written for me. That was the first time that I had to experience reading the scripture as an historical document, as an ancient document, as written to somebody else that happens to continue to speak to us today in the church. Not to me. That was very difficult. I wouldn't have had to go through that difficult experience, which happens a lot still today, if I had read closely Mark chapter 1, which we have done since the beginning of the year. Mark chapter 1, Mark is going through breakneck speed. We are only 39 verses, just a few more verses left in the chapter of Mark, first chapter of Mark. And already we have Jesus' baptism, his trial in the wilderness for 40 days, his calling of the first four disciples, Simon, um, Andrew, James, and John. Then he goes to the synagogue already. He teaches there. He heals a man. Now he's at Simon's house. And then, by the end of our passage today, his word and fame has spread through all of Galilee. All of that in the first chapter. Mark is running really fast to lay down some, some foundational principles so that we can understand the rest of the gospel based on those principles. And one of those, the, the, so in, the, in this, in this fast um, course through this, these, these events, we find out, we find who Jesus is. His identity is revealed in his baptism. 
You are my son, and with you I am well pleased. And then we remember that that identity was tested for 40 days in the wilderness as he was tempted to be all sorts of other things, and it, and it was revealed what it means to be a child of God. And then when Jesus calls his disciples, Mark teaches us that he does so in an authoritative way that they just drop what they're doing and follow him. And further than that, he even is, has power and authority over unclean spirits. Mark wants to lay that foundation in our minds as well. And, and now, in this passage, as the, as the chapter comes to an end, Mark is laying down the foundational principle that this teaching and ministry of Jesus is expansive. It starts in Simon's house. Simon, you know him also as Peter. They go to Simon's house right after the synagogue, Mark tells us, the synagogue scene, and, and Simon's mother-in-law is sick. Now, if you've ever heard this um, passage preached, Jesus you know, finds this out, and he heals her. And every preacher I've known always has to say, so I'm going to say it too, maybe this wasn't such a great blessing to Simon to have his mother-in-law healed. <clears throat> Now, that's a cheap shot about, you know, in-laws. And it's funny. See, it got the joke. It got the laugh. But it really misses Mark's point, I think. This is a personal encounter for Peter, for, for Simon. Other people have other questions about this, though. Like, why, as soon as she is healed, does she get up and start serving them? Is this some kind of commentary on gender roles that the Bible is, is, uh, is, is giving us? Is this kind of like God's will for women in the household? You can hear that on, in a pulpit, not this one, but on this Sunday in some other pulpit, that's what you'll hear. Or is this just a reflection of the culture of the time? That this is the role that women held, and, and so when she was healed, this, this naturally what she would do is, is get up and play host and start serving people. I think it's a little more practical than that. It might be a, a reflection of the culture. Certainly all of Scripture is. But, but what I get from this is that bodies are important to Jesus. Bodies are as important as souls are to Jesus. Which is why he goes around proclaiming the good news and healing and casting out demons. And there's another lesson to be drawn from Simon's mother-in-law, but we'll return to it in a moment. And here we see the first expansion that Mark teaches us. Because not only is Jesus going to heal Simon's mother-in-law, but then um, the, the ministry expands. Mark tells us at sunset, the whole city begins to come to Simon's house. At sunset is a clue for us, a literary clue that Mark gives us, that a new day has begun. Because remember, the Jews start the day in the evening after the sun goes down. And so Mark is telling us a new day has has come. This is the inauguration of a new day with this Jesus. And note that the whole city is bringing the sick to him. The sick in body. They're not bringing the ignorant to be taught by Jesus. They're bringing the infirmed to be healed by Jesus. I think there's something instructive there about the priorities the church might take up. Another observation is that in the morning, while it is still very dark, Jesus goes out to a deserted place and prays. And I think what Mark is reminding us of here is that Jesus works at night. He works in dark times. And he works in dark places. And while it seems dark and like nothing can be done for us, Jesus is at work healing the world. A final observation to make on that is that Jesus depends on prayer. He's been, he's been healing people all night and teaching during the day. And yet, he gets up early and prays. Remember when we had our time together over the summer, and I, I shared with you that, that we can have set-apart time And set apart locations. And that that indicates our intention. So like when I get up at 6 o'clock, that's a particular time. And I go to the gym, that's a particular location. I have the intention of working out. 
But I taught you that when we add silence to that equation, time, location, and silence, that's not just intention, that is attention. That is when we go before God and we just listen to what God has to say to us. And that is what Jesus is doing on this morning. While it is still dark, he goes out to a deserted place and he prays. That's the definition of discernment. Going to a particular time in a particular place with your silence to hear what God is saying. Why is that important? Because what happens when he's out there is that the disciples, Simon and the others, the the four of them, they are hunting for Jesus, Mark tells us. Hunting. That's how it's translated. That's what the word means. Now, I know some of you are hunters. When you're hunting for something, you have, you have it in mind. You're looking for that thing, and you have, you're going to take it. You're going to control it for a purpose that you have in mind for it. And that's what the disciples are doing. They are hunting for Jesus to capture him, to control him, to put him to use for personal ends. Because we're told that all of the people that were sick came to the house. But Mark is very clear to tell us that he healed many of them. He didn't heal all of them. So Simon has in mind, hey, there's still people in my town that need to be healed. So get off your knees and let's go back to mom's house and we're going to continue healing my town. They're hunting for Jesus to put him back to profitable work. But Jesus says, you know what? Let's move on. Let's move on. When is it time to move on? When is it time to let go of things that have happened in the past or are happening now and to be open to um, something new? To be open to a new horizon, to a new mission field, to a new place that God is leading us. But that's what Jesus does. He moves on to proclaim the message elsewhere because that's what I came to do, he said. I can only imagine Simon's disappointment. Simon might have been thinking, you know, we could probably monetize this. I mean, we've got a bunch of people healed already, but, you know, today it's a new day. Maybe we can, like, charge people or, you know, I can make new friends or... But no. Jesus like, we've healed these people. That's all we're going to do. It's time to move on. When it's time to move on is a matter of discernment. Jesus had the conviction to say no to Simon and yes to the rest of Galilee because he spent some time in discernment. And he knew it was time to go. It takes time to discern. It takes a location to discern. And it takes silence to discern. That's why Jesus, early in the morning, goes to a deserted place so that he can be in silence and listen. And for Mark, this is the expansion of Jesus' ministry. It is so important to Mark to get this all in the first few verses that he tells the story quickly to get to this point. Because Mark knows that when God blesses us, like Peter felt blessed and his mother-in-law felt blessed and all of those many who were healed in that town felt blessed, we feel at the center of the universe. And that feels good. But what we can forget is that God is at the center of the universe, not us. And we might forget that most famous blessing that God gave to Abraham. Who who heard God say to him, I'm going to bless you with a blessing so great it will bless all the nations of the world. But now you got to move, he says to Abraham. Pack up your stuff, leave everything behind, and go. Where? To a place I will show you. 
That's the answer. You get this blessing, and it feels like the center of the world is right there. And it is. Because the center of the world is not the blessing. But the center of the world is the one who blesses. And it feels great to receive that blessing. Because we feel and we are at the center of the world. God has blessed us. But because God is at the center of the universe and not us, that blessing moves. And if we want to keep that feeling, which I do, and most people who experience it do, I want this feeling to continue. If we want to still feel at the center, then we have to move. We have to follow that blessing. We have to follow Christ. As he expands the blessing beyond Simon's house and family to the whole city. And beyond that city to the whole region of Galilee. He is more than your personal Lord and Savior. He is the Lord and Savior of the entire world. So let me ask you, where is God moving in your life? Where is God calling you to get out of the center and instead to follow the center? Will you? Where is God moving in the city of Pueblo? Where is that blessing going? And will First Presbyterian Church follow that blessing and remain with the center of the universe. So let's return to Simon's mother-in-law. She's the symbol of this whole teaching, I think. She is pointed out to Jesus as somebody who needs help. And he raises her. He heals her. He blesses her. And the first thing she does, Mark tells us, is serve them. She receives that personal blessing like Abraham, and then she serves like Abraham. The center of the universe is revealed in Jesus Christ, and may we always find ourselves there. Jesus gave us this sacrament. Nancy, you want to come with me? Jesus gave us this sacrament to remind us of his presence. He invites you now to follow him here to receive the body of Christ. And he invites you afterwards to follow him somewhere else to be the body of Christ. Here you receive the blessing. From here you give the blessing. And in doing so, we stay at the center of the universe. Come meet your personal Lord and Savior here and the Lord and Savior of the entire world. And Nancy is going to lead us in our ritual. I'm going to grab this. You too. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he took it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you, sealed. Whenever you drink from this cup, remember the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks. It is right, eternal God, to give you thanks on this Lord's day. For this is the day set aside specifically to worship you in remembrance and gratitude. We remember you created all that is and that you are the giver of life. We thank you. When we forget, we also fail to live in a way that is pleasing to you. We take matters into our own hands, believe ourselves to be our own creators, and our selfishness hurts others, hurts ourselves and the rest of creation. 
But you did not abandon us to our sin, gracious God. You sent Jesus to reignite your light in the world and to remind us that you made humanity in your image. He called us once again to be good and faithful stewards of one another and of the earth. Jesus taught us in word and deed what it means to be a child of God. He demonstrated the sacrificial nature of divine love, yielding to the violent nature of self-love, which crucified him. But you have resurrected him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand. In that same spirit, we call upon you, faithful God. We pray not only that you would empower us to live as your children in imitation of Christ our Savior, but we pray also that you would raise us up to that heavenly banquet where you are the host for all who have died and whom you have redeemed in Christ. Most recently, Bill Heath. Since we are all one in Christ by the power of your Spirit, upon whom we now call, death does not separate us from one another. And so we pause in these next few moments to name others who, having entered your rest from their labors, join us at this table. Comfort us in our loss, strengthen us on our journey, And renew your hope within us, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As those who are assisting to serve come forward, what you will do is um, come forward and you'll receive the bread. If you need gluten-free, let us know. We have that for you. And then you'll proceed to the side and you'll receive the cup. Um, On that way, go ahead and partake of the bread and when you'll receive the cup, Dispose of that cup at the trash receptacle on the, at the end of the pews and then return back to your, your seats. We, will have, we do have Stephen ministers. They are the ones in the white stoles who are, are available to pray with you if you would like to stop on your way back to the seat and have someone to pray with you. We'll serve you and then we'll serve you.
Let us pray. Almighty God, receiving your grace in this way through the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood, we can hardly imagine a more personal encounter. Thank you for taking grains from the earth and through the labor of human hands giving us bread and grapes from the vine and through the labor of of human hands giving us wine so that the great gift of Christ's divinity through the hands of his humanity we receive your grace, your forgiveness the power to continue on our journey. Bless us in this way as we receive it with thanksgiving and send us with the courage to follow in his way. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. At this time, I invite, there she is, Mandy to come forward. To share with us an exciting opportunity to be together. Morning, everyone. Um, next Sunday is you. Many of you know is Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, one of our uh, youth fundraising events is going to be uh, Super Bowl uh, Sunday, uh, spelled S O U P E R. Uh, the youth will be serving soup and chili downstairs in the labyrinth area, and we will be airing the game. So anybody who wants to come share a meal and um, partake in some camaraderie and shenanigans while watching the game, uh, mild shenanigans, (laughs) Um, please join us. Uh, It will be... $5 for a a bowl of soup or chili and crackers and a drink. And then we will have an additional bake sale off to the side for dessert. Um, The bake sale funds will go directly towards our youth music program. Um, And the funds for the overall youth event will go towards the youth program as a whole. But... The kiddos wanted to make sure that the bake sale went directly to the music department. So. But please join us. It starts at 4 o'clock. We will have some to-go containers if folks um, would, if anybody's a comfort creature like me and would much rather watch the game at home in PJs, totally understand. We will have um, things set up to where you can take to-go, ta- to-go containers. So... But uh, please fill out your Connect First card so that we make sure that we have enough food for everybody. Thank you. And now with joy and gratitude for all that we have been given, let us offer our tithes and our gifts to God.
O God, maker and provider, you have blessed us with many gifts. Use us in what we have gathered to feed the world through your love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. Almighty God, we await you in prayer, bowing our heads before you, humbly seeking your presence, your help, and your hope. You taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere. Hear us now as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church to bear witness to Christ's power and love. May we embody your triune unity and work together for peace. Lead all nations in the way of justice. Direct those who govern to seek paths of diplomacy and peace to calm the troubled waters of conflict, to respect the dignity of all life, and to defend oppressed people. Awaken all people to the damage we have inflicted upon the earth. Instill in us a reverence for your creation that we may preserve its delicate balance for all coming generations. Give comfort and relief to all who are experiencing troubles, sorrow, poverty, sickness, grief, especially those known to us who we name now before you in our silence. Heal these souls in body, mind, or circumstance, renewing them by your grace, helping them face their challenges with the strength of faith. Holy Spirit, breathe new life into church congregations today, wherever they are meeting. Surprise us with your power and your presence. Heal the sick, bind up the broken hearts, and renew in us an all-consuming passion For Jesus Christ. We lift these prayers to you, gracious God, confident that you hear us and know even the prayers we are too afraid to pray. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices to praise the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together now as we stand and sing hymn 796. We come to you for healing, Lord, and we would advise you use your hymn books again.
Friends, may you go from this place having received the blessing of God, and as you follow God this week, may you discover that God is blessing others through you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.